Hello, welcome, uh, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you are, welcome to this webinar, which is jointly organized by the Center of Migration Research at the University of Warsaw and the Migration Policy Center at the European University Institute in Florence. Uh, the focus for today's webinar is on Ukrainian refugees in Poland. And uh, obviously the, it's, a, it's a crucial issue, really important issue. Uh, we know around 2.1 million Ukrainian people have been displaced, and of those, around 1.3 million are in Poland, and those numbers are only likely to grow. So it's I'm really pleased to that we are able today to hear from three experts about the situation on the ground in Poland. I'll introduce the speakers to you, then just to also just explain a little bit about the format of the webinar before we get into the presentations. So we have three speakers in the order in which they speak. First of all, we'll be hearing from Dr. Marta Yarosevich, who's an assistant professor at the Center of Migration Research since October 2019, and has been the principal investigator on the project on the securitization, desecuritization of migration, on the example of Ukrainian migration to Poland and internal migration in Ukraine. We'll hear from Marta first. We'll then hear from Marta Pachoka, who's head of the Migration Policies Research Unit at the Centre of Migration Research at the University of Warsaw. And then we'll hear from uh, Karolina Yukosevich, who's a Mary Sklodowska Curie Fellow at the Centre of Migration Research, who works on immigrant integration and poverty policies in urban contexts. What we're going to do is have a format where we're going to address a series of issues through the presentations. Uh, first of all, we're going to be hearing about the situation, uh, well, the kind of the context, the background, uh, to understand more about the relationship between Ukraine and Poland in terms of migration, how that has been influencing current displacement, and to understand more about the situation at the border. So we'll hear from uh, Marty Yerosevich about that. Uh, then uh, Marta Pachaka is going to be talking about some of the mobilizations we've seen in Poland, but also some of the interventions by international organizations such as UNHCR. And then uh, Karolina uh, will be talking about some of the longer term implications for reception in Poland and also thinking about some of the wider implications for Europe and the EU. So the idea is that the presentations will uh, and discussion will last around 45 minutes. Uh, then we'll have time for Q&A. So the Q&A, the way that we do that is you can put your questions into the chat function on, our, on the YouTube channel, and then we can put the questions to the, particip uh, to, the, to the speaker. So please feel free to interact in that way. It's not the most ideal form of interaction, but uh, please feel free if you have questions or points you want to raise to do so in the chat function in uh, on the YouTube channel. So without further ado, I'd like to move immediately to Dr. Marty Yarosevich, who's going to talk about the, uh, the kind of the context and uh, the situation at the border. So over to you, Marta. Thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you very much for the invitation. I just uh, ask, I will ask my colleague at the beginning, Karolina, can you please uh, open the presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, so before I saw the presentation, it's for uh, three of us, but um, uh, but I will start from like I was introduced already, but just to let you know that I'm like I am <laughs> very kind of engaged uh, uh, in the topics related uh, uh, to Ukraine. I've been dealing with Ukraine for more than 15 years already. In the past, I was working also for IOM office in Kiev. Uh, and the European delegation office in Kiev, and like my daughter was born in Kiev, so I may be emotional, so please forgive me that. And many colleagues of mine remind in Ukraine, and they each day they are showing courage and heroism in preserving their states and protecting the civilians. This is what, like, this is what I want to say at the beginning. And then uh, that our presentation is illustrated by maps of photos, just, uh, just only to give you the like overview, the geopolitical context uh, and some and photos, but photos, uh, photos are not random. These photos were chosen not from open sources, but we asked our colleagues who have reminder or who work there to share with us with the info photos, right? So they are quite personal in the sense that the people from Ukraine have chosen those photos, right? I, I left, we left to them 
uh, which photos to show to, to, to best illustrate the humanitarian situation and daily life in Ukraine in the past 14 days. And uh, so, Carolina, can you please change the first slide? Okay. I'm sorry because you know everything is like we are all working in emergency mode, so I didn't have time to translate the first map from Ukrainian to Pol uh, to English. But um, just you know to, to show you the generally uh, the the ge general security situation, what is going on there. So this is the this is the the last the last map from from yesterday showing the positions of the Russian army in the main. Uh, places of attack of the Russian army on, on Ukraine. So uh, Russia on February 24th, Russia launched an all-out invasion of Ukraine by land, air and sea, which is the biggest attack by one state against another one in Europe since the World, World War II. And as you can see, the attack, uh, the attack uh, came from both uh, north, which is the border with Belarus, uh, so from the territory of Belarus, from the uh, from the east, which is the like classical, classical, right? One would say so. Front line uh, when the separatist regions of Ugansk and Donetsk are placed, and also from the south, also from the sea, to the seaports of uh, the main seaport there is Odessa and Mariupol. Uh, can you please, Carolina, change the slide? Thank you. And um, so, uh, like by by doing that, Russia, it was a clear violation of uh, like Article Two of the UN Charter that prohibits the use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state. But also clear violation of Budapest Memorandum that uh, of 1991 that provides security assurances to Ukraine for its territorial integrity when giving up the nuclear nuclear arsenal to Russia, but this is also a crime incurring individual responsibility. However, Russia is not a part to in, uh, international criminal court, uh, but Ukraine is, and uh, all, all the crimes, violations of human, of human, uh, of humanitarian law that happened and then happened in the Ukrainian territory uh, can be, uh, can be uh, prosecuted. Uh, so, uh, so far, uh, the referral for investigation has been made by 39 states to the International Criminal Court on escalation in violations of humanitarian and human rights law, uh, including deaths of civilians uh, and the use of indis indiscriminate weapons such as ballistic missiles and ban weapons such as cluster bombs or thermobaric weapons. And also, this is the violation of protocol, additional protocol to Geneva Convention of 49. And why I am saying that, <laughs> uh, sorry, please excuse for such a long introduction, because actually when we are meeting uh, refugees all, all, all the time at our streets, and we, uh, we, we try to also provide some, like everybody in Poland now, because you know there is a, such a big influx of refugees uh, trying to help them that I already collected several evidences, uh, people telling me about cluster bombs shielding their homes and that as a main decision to move kind of further from, uh, from, uh, from Ukraine to Poland. Uh, so um, I will give you some numbers maybe now. After 13 days of intense fighting, uh, the civilian casualties continued to mount across the country. And according to the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, as of yesterday, at least 1,000.3, uh, they are reported 1.3 uh, thousand civilian casualties, including 500 killed. However, they believe that number of civilian casualties is much likely higher. And also what is very important is that uh, the destruction of civilian objects continues to be not only reported but also to increase. So far, uh, so far, almost three, uh, 300 schools have been damaged, at least 46 hospitals, and more than and almost 2,000 residential buildings. 
So, uh, so this is the humanitarian situation, and now I will uh, I will move more. Uh, like uh, why, why the people, so generally it's obvious that people are running to save their lives, right? Uh, I'm running to save their lives uh, and due to the increasing humanitarian situation. Also, I didn't mention, uh, I didn't mention that especially difficult situation is in two cities. One that I already mentioned at the sea, Mariupol, which is, uh, which is encircled already for 10 days without water and, and electricity. And also Volnovaha in Eastern Ukraine and the, at the border with, uh, with Ugansk and Donetsk Republic also encircled for like since the beginning of the Russian aggression. Uh, so they are like the access to food and critical health services is limited. Maybe it's lacking actually now in those cities. So why Poland? Um, uh, like before, before I move to there, I would like to, to, to underline that, of course, Poland accepted the biggest number of refugees. However, like, uh, like in terms of uh, number of refugees per capita, and uh, other countries are even more affected, especially highly vul vulnerable is Moldova, which is a small country and accepted more than 200,000 refugees so far. Uh, so, but why the people are coming to Poland? I believe that there are like several reasons. Firstly, because this is due to individual security aspect. As you can see at the map, this is the safest and easiest route that comes through the safest location. Because I mean, in terms of uh, possible rocket and artillery attacks, right? Of course, they were, they were some uh, rocket attacks uh, in Western Ukraine, in Lviv, in Vinica, in Łódź, but generally still this is the, the, the most safe, uh, the most safe route. Also, uh, also, uh, but it, what is also important and what the travelers are telling us, apart from this possible rocket attacks, these are attacks by uh, by diverse div diverse and groups, right? So, so th those two routes ap apparently are the safest. Uh, when it comes to border with Slovakia and Hungary, they are also relatively safe, but they go through mountains, and sometimes it's difficult, more difficult to go there. Just basically, right? To go to get to the uh, to the border uh, to the border crossing points, and it's also the longest EU border. When it comes to more structural factors, one should mention that there are almost two million of Ukrainian citizens that previously reside in Poland, and uh, like extensive uh, Ukrainian mi minority networks. In 2019, Poland became a prime destination, uh, like uh, the, the the global leader, a prime destination for foreign and seasonal short-term labor la labor at the global level. So, uh, so and the, the second the second trait is that generally the uh, labor immigration to Poland is uh, homogeneous in like one national, and these are Ukrainians, right? So Ukrainian citizens constitute the overwhelming majority of total number of incoming foreigners. Sometimes it was in the past even called the Ukrainization of Polish labor market. Uh, we, we used to, uh, to uh, we used this term at CMR. And all, did, all this happened, it was labor migration, but it was also kind of forced migration. This is what I am trying to study for, for, for already eight years, that like generally this inflow already started in 2014, after the first uh, the eruption, the Russian annexation of Crimea, and the, the, first, uh, the first aggression on, on Eastern Ukraine. Karolina, can you please change the flight? Okay. So, so, so uh, sorry, maybe I will just you know show uh, show you. So these are the photos of the evacuation from Irkin, uh, which is a close city to Kiev, like uh, Dacha, so called uh, area of Kiev, 50, uh, 50 kilometers of Kiev from Kiev. Uh, like this is photo from from three days made three days ago by my colleague, who still a Polish journalist who still remains in Kiev. Please, Karolina, can you another one? But um, uh, this is like photo of like normal life, daily life in Kiev, because after four uh, four, uh, four days, the Kiev tube was uh, started operating again, and, and because there there is no other transport, uh, it's too dangerous to travel by road. So metro is still operating, and people uh, they they use metro as a main uh, their travel. 
Yeah, and now this is the evacuation. This is the hospital, the, ch the children hospital evacuated to the uh, evacuated, uh, evacuated. Uh, and this is the, the, the photo of like, yeah, the, 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 the way uh, to the shelter, the way they are. Uh, yeah, I will leave maybe for the, okay. So, uh, so in less than two weeks, more than 2 million people have fled to flee to neighboring countries generating ever-growing protection risk, including sexual exploitation and abuse risk, because we should remember that majority of people on the move are women and children. And uh, also the rapid and massive, there is also like, and I think it's not so clear, uh, it's not so clear, uh, at least for the like global media, Western media, that there is also huge internal displacement happening in Ukraine. And recently, the city mayor of Lviv warned that Lviv is facing a breaking point when it comes to its capacity to absorb more displaced people. Uh, so there are already 200,000 internally displaced people in Lviv, in the city of Lviv. And according to UNHCR data, Poland accepted 1.2 million people, right? This is what I said already. And also, uh, what is important that half million of those people, these are children, uh, which is which also uh, creates uh, another humanitarian uh, humanitarian problems. Um, I'm not sure how much time. I think I should be I should be finishing. Maybe the, maybe the final point uh, that uh, one should also remember that not only Ukrainians are leaving Ukraine. Uh, that in the past uh, there, there was a huge community of uh, foreign students studying in Ukraine. Almost uh, 80,000 foreign students were studying at Ukrainian universities, and they are also leaving uh, Ukraine through, through the Polish border. And like so far, and we are working on, like we as expert community are working or more, trying to work uh, to assist the government on more long-term a solution for them, but for now, people of other than Ukrainian nationality who cross the Polish border are allowed to stay in Poland for 15 days. And during this time, they must apply either for international protection, either they need to return to their country of origin. When it comes to the, maybe the final, uh, final thing, when it comes to the uh, situation at the border crossing points, of course, it was very chaotic at the beginning in the first three, four days. Now it's getting better, but uh, it also depends on the day, right? Because uh, now there is kind of regr regrouping. We can observe kind of regrouping of the Russian troops, like kind of silence in the front, right? But generally what we could see, this is always like that, that um, the biggest numbers are coming uh, after day or two after the bomb shillings uh, or something like that, right? Then the numbers are growing, are growing significantly. So yesterday it was calmer. Today we are expecting it will be calmer, but maybe tomorrow uh, the number will get high. And what is very important is that, um, is that, that uh, especially near the smaller border crossing points, we have eight border crossing points with Ukraine. There is an insufficient number of, of tents and other places where people could, could warm themselves. And it's really, still it's very, it's very chilly, unfortunately, in, in Poland. Thank you very much. I, sorry for being too late. I pass the floor to Marta. Thank, thank you very much, Marta. That was uh, a fantastic overview. And uh, I think it's really, <clears throat> powerfully illustrating the challenge of internal international displacement and the kind of the scale and the underlying drivers. I think you've done that excellently. I think now moving on to Marta Pachoka, who's going to be talking uh, about the kind of a role of various kinds of stakeholders nationally and internationally in organizing a response to the uh, devastating drivers that uh, Marta just illustrated to us. So very happy now to hand over to Marta. And, and just to remind anybody watching, if you have questions, please feel free to put them into the chat box. Over to you, Marta. While Marta will be talking, I can show some more photos from Poland this time. So Polish border area and Polish border towns. Thanks. 
So uh, thank you, Andrew, for giving me the floor. So hello, everyone. So now we are just moving to see what has happened in recent years, in fact, almost two weeks, uh, two recent weeks uh, in Poland. Uh, very briefly, so the current crisis, the crisis that we see um, in Eastern Europe uh, is not the first crisis we've seen in recent years in the EU member states. So just let me uh, let me remind you about the so-called migration and refugee crisis of 2015-2016. Uh, that crisis mostly affected uh, Mediterranean countries of the EU, so Italy, Greece uh, and Spain, uh, as you know. Um, and just to remind you there was a big uh, horizon 2020 project where cmr was uh, one of the partners this was the project mass migration governance in europe and beyond respond that was run by our colleagues from the Uppsala university in sweden so there is uh, really a big literature and a big number of uh, country research reports including poland that uh, described and presented in detail what uh, was going on in Poland um, that time in mid uh, in uh, 2015 2016 2017 in terms of migration flows so now we have another crisis the crisis that really affects directly Poland and its um, and its society and i would say that this crisis is of twofold nature so firstly we are facing uh, the humanitarian crisis in Ukraine, and Marta has just explained why and what does it mean, how it looks like. Uh, and it hard, it's very hard to say that this is a typical everyday life that we see now in Ukraine. And what uh, I would uh, see in Poland is uh, a kind of refugee crisis, because the people that are fleeing from Ukraine uh, can be considered asylum seekers, refugees in this uh, broad way of, um, of um, uh, understanding. Obviously, so far, not many of them uh, has, uh, have applied uh, for international protection um, according to the uh, European uh, EU acquis. So we have this crisis. I will now focus on Poland and uh, I would like um, to, to stress that the situation in Poland is really um, a multi-stakeholder and uh, multi-dimensional uh, crisis. This is a really huge exercise, exercise of communication, exercise of coordination of different actors. And I would divide these actors obviously into two main groups. So state actors at the central level and uh, local government level, and then non-state actors. And um, to be as precise as possible, I would like to refer to the to the uh, Center of Migration Research uh, recent newsletter that was co-authored by uh, myself and colleagues from CMR, including uh, Marta Jaroszewicz. Uh, it was published yesterday in Polish, today in English, and it's about Russian aggression on Ukraine and forced migrations. They're all fallen in the first days of the crisis. So there is the section where we uh, stress the key role of local authorities and non-governmental organization in supporting people fleeing from uh, fleeing Ukraine. Uh, so given the huge dynamics of events and the dramatically growing number of people in need of immediate humanitarian aid, local authorities and NGOs have stepped in to act. This was especially the case in cities and towns near the border, so Polish-Ukrainian border, but also those through which people travel and where um, immediate aid can be offered. So obviously we have here in mind Warsaw, so the capital city, because this is the biggest city, the biggest labor market, uh, and it can uh, it can um, receive the highest number of people. But then there are many other cities, uh, big cities that are involved in receiving, uh, let's say, refugees from Ukraine. Uh, it's Krakow, uh, it's Lublin, but also these are cities uh, in Western uh, regions of uh, our country, like Svinemunde. Um, naturally, a large number of citizens of Ukraine as I've already said, arrived in Warsaw, traveling in private vehicles, collective transportation, transportation organized by NGOs, universities, families, and friends. Um, and now I would like to briefly uh, tell you more what uh, has happened in Warsaw since uh, 24th of, uh, uh, of February, because uh, this is, I think, the, the very good uh, example how the uh, city hall and uh, non-governmental organizations uh, can work together 
but also be, be involved in the learning process, how to manage this kind of emergency uh, situation, because this is not a typical way of receiving uh, forced migrants uh, in, a, in the country. So here, this typical everyday tools that we have in legal terms, in uh, institutional terms, it, it, they, they do not work. So what has happened uh, in, um, in Warsaw and what was very useful from the very first day of the crisis uh, was the platform that we call branch or sectoral uh, social dialogue commission for foreigners. This is a kind of advisor, advisory body um, uh, that, is, um, uh, that is composed of uh, uh, people working uh, in the Warsaw City Hall, but also uh, is composed of uh, representatives of different non-governmental organizations, not only those dealing with migration and foreigners, but also those uh, providing, for example, legal advice to different people, vulnerable groups uh, and humanitarian aid. So this uh, body, uh, this platform of dialogue uh, has met uh, already on Thursday. And since then, this body uh, is really uh, developing a kind of a common uh, response uh, to the crisis. Obviously, it's not very easy uh, because we have two different types of stakeholders. Some are, so on one side, we have this uh, more flexible uh, non-governmental organizations. And in fact, they were, in my opinion, the first uh, in, uh, uh, at the railway station in different places of, uh, of, uh, of our capital city, just to provide uh, human humanitarian support uh, to, uh, to refugees. Then we have the, the, the city, the city hall, and it, it, and it different, uh, it's different units, but municipality is more uh, formal and it has to follow some legal and institutional um, uh, conditions rules of how it can organize and provide uh, its support. So as of now, the way these two different stakeholders are working together, I would say is much more coherent as it was during the very first days. So since, uh, if I'm correct, since uh, Monday, what was established and what uh, what is uh, situated in the very city heart of uh, Warsaw is the cooperation uh, support center in uh, the Palace of Culture and Science, but it's not the place for migrants themselves. It's the place where uh, different stakeholders, including uh, city representatives, NGOs, and uh, any volunteer can work together and discuss how to proceed and which actions can be um, can be taken. So what kind of support is organized by Warsaw and by other uh, cities, big and small, uh, in Poland? So obviously, this is about uh, legal support or legal advice, uh, information points uh, about housing, about medical services, psychological support, and, uh, and so on. Uh, also, many cities, um, have launched their uh, websites, not only in Polish, but in Ukrainian and in English, to make it uh, uh, accessible for uh, people uh, living, uh, fleeing uh, Ukraine. Obviously, there are, there are dedicated phone help, helplines uh, and so on. Um, another important stakeholder to be mentioned here is the so-called Union of Polish Metropolises that is uh, composed uh, of 12 main cities in our country. So this is rather an advisory platform as well, but for local governments from uh, 12 cities. Uh, so the union have also started exchanging experiences. They underlined that as was the case during the evacuation of people from Afghanistan in 2021, local governments are willing to step up to the challenge, but this demands cooperation at all levels of the administration, especially legal and financial solution at the central level. Um, what, what we can see in media, uh, in, uh, in media, uh, media coverage, not only in Poland, but also abroad, uh, is a huge role of non-governmental organizations that are, uh, that, that are really involved in providing uh, any kind of support 
uh, to uh, refugees, not only Ukrainians, but also non-Ukrainians that, uh, that left, um, left the country. Um, so NGOs are really an important stakeholder of this map, of this network of different actors that we have uh, in Poland, and they play a crucial role since many years. It was also the case in 2015, but also it was the case in uh, uh, autumn 2021 during the so-called humanitarian crisis on the Polish-Belarusian uh, Belarusian border. So this we have to keep uh, in mind. Uh, another stakeholder that has to be mentioned is obviously uh, the government. So I, will know, I don't want to go into details now. This you can find in our CMR uh, spotlight. But from my perspective, the, the role of the government now is just to provide stable, uh, legal, institutional and political environment to allow uh, local governments and non-governmental organizations work. So now the government is working on the special law uh, on assistance to Ukrainian citizens in connection with an armed conflict in the territory of that state. So yesterday, uh, this uh, draft law uh, was discussed. Uh, at the very beginning, it had only, if I'm correct, uh, up to 40 pages. Now it's almost 70 pages. Uh, there are obviously very detailed legal solutions to be uh, applied, uh, to be applied in the future, but there are also many doubts. For example, why it is limited only to Ukrainians and it, uh, it does not take into consideration uh, migrants, uh, forced migrants of uh, other, uh, of other uh, nationalities. Um, then we have also the stakeholders at this international level, and very briefly, I will refer to two of them. So there is obviously the European Union and its uh, agencies, uh, Frontex, European Border and Coast Guard Agency, and the new European Asylum Support Office, now uh, known as European Union as I, uh, Agency for, uh, for Asylum. So in terms of the EU response and support provided to, to migrants and to receiving countries, uh, I want to mention only one, one uh, tool that is of key importance. It's obviously the, uh, the decision that was, was taken by the European Commission on uh, the 2nd of March uh, about uh, triggering the mechanism foreseen in the Council Directive from 2001 uh, regarding uh, temporary protection. So, uh, so now the temporary protection is uh, on the table and it's, uh, it, wa it, it, it was launched by the uh, Council on, um, on the 4th of April, and it's up to the member states and their national uh, legal framework how this temporary protection will be implemented uh, in practice. And the very, the, the very last uh, international stakeholder to be mentioned is uh, UNHCR, so United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, uh, just a few days a few days ago unhcr office in poland has launched something what is called rrp uh, rrrrp so regional refugee response plan uh, it covers uh, five countries main receiving uh, countries uh, main receiving countries of uh, false migrants and poland is considered the primary country obviously because of the high number of people uh, coming here uh, other countries that are covered are other EU member states bordering with Ukraine, so Hungary, Romania, Slovakia, and one non-EU country, so Moldova. Uh, it might be interesting to discuss this refugee response in detail later. Just to mention, uh, UNHCR will work uh, in cooperation with other stakeholders, national stakeholders, and uh, uh, including our government, but also non-governmental uh, organizations. Uh, and the time frame of this uh, re refugee response plan is scheduled from March uh, to August 2022. So just now they are collecting the ideas and project proposals to be developed and launched by different stakeholders in Poland with the budget that is planned. And on this basis, they will create something um, 
as the official launch, uh, official framework of this RRP uh, scheme in Poland. And according to the timeline I, I just uh, have in my hands, it's scheduled for 18 of March. So I think I will stop here and I will give the floor to Carolina. Thank you, Marta. Uh, I think that was a, a really excellent overview of the kind of the immediate response. I think now we've moved on to Carolina to think perhaps, so, and we've actually got some questions about this in the in the chat box already about maybe medium to longer term implications of, rece of reception in Ukraine and also some of the wider implications for Europe and the EU. Also, just to let you know that Marta referred to a, I think it's a spotlight report produced by CMR very recently, if not yesterday, in English, and I've put a link to it in the chat box. So I think you can read the report that was referred to in the chat box on, our, on the YouTube channel if you want to look at that as well. Hopefully it's the right one. So over to you, Carolina. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, so yes, I will, I will try to explain how, how the current situation um, what are the implications of the current situation and what is also the broader context um, in which um, um, uh, broader context of the crisis, which also includes the Polish uh, refugee reception system. Um, so first of all, um, the prior the crisis, the refugee reception system that exists in Poland has never processed uh, anything comparable to the current situation. Historically, uh, the system that we have served some 100,000 refugees, mainly from Chechnya over the period of nearly 30 years. Um, and currently we already have 1.3 million re refugees who entered Poland uh, and more is expected to, to flee. Uh, historically, Ukrainians have not been entering, even during the military crisis in Donbas, in Poland, through the um, uh, through the uh, asylum procedure because it's uh, it's extremely um, timely, and Poland offered other uh, more employment-based alternatives that were always easier for Ukrainians. Uh, we have some uh, 300,000 regular migrants hold from Ukraine holding residence cards in Poland, and they constitute some 60% of foreign-born residents in Poland, and mostly that refers to labor migrants. Um, but uh, at the same time, uh, I want to stress that we do have asylum procedures. We In Poland, we do offer integration programs which are co coordinated by central government and implemented by public uh, local uh, local authorities. Um, and yet today the system seems to be like uh, completely unrelated to the current response of the government, uh, either on a central or on the local levels. So first let me start with br briefly describing the system. So as I mentioned, the typical asylum procedure is time consuming in Poland. It even lasts up to a year or longer. Uh, actually, in the recent years, it was uh, uh, even longer. Uh, but during the procedure, people um, have been historically and are legally offered housing, basic cash transfer, and basic social ser services. And once they are granted some kind of international protection, then they are eligible for a one year long integration programs that also offer cash assistance, social services, assistance with job placement uh, and so on. And prior to the current crisis, the system has been known uh, for being underfunded, understaffed with high staff turnover, and in many ways not optimal, could be more efficient than it was, uh, but it existed for um, also, I should mention that for um, many refugees who has been coming to Poland prior to the current crisis, the regular welfare benefits and specifically child benefits has been um, more appreciated uh, or very or as appreciated as as other forms of support. So access to the regular um, child benefits available for all residents of Poland. And um, historically, non-governmental organizations have been stepping in when the government was uh, was failing or were um, filling the gaps with how the system operated. Uh, but there were like many issues uh, with such a situation, meaning that the the, um, uh, the services they offered were 
better in bigger towns than smaller, um, uh, not always well coordinated, uh, providing varying quality of, of services. So, um, um, yes, um, in some the system we had set up before the current crisis could not accommodate 1.3 million refugees. But uh, the question is, is inventing a brand new system, which is currently happening in Poland in the, uh, in the crisis context, is a better solution. Uh, and I'm, uh, I have doubts about that. And, um, and so uh, to sum up what Marta was describing, what is happening in Poland now, there is this new law being developed, will, which will create like a new path, uh, path to legalize uh, refugees coming from Ukraine. Um, and it's problematic in many different ways. It's a, it's a temporary protection. It differentiates people into the citizens of, um, Ukraine versus non-citizens, or it, as of now, it doesn't include the families, family members of uh, Ukrainian citizens. And most of all, it doesn't, it does provide access to, uh, for one of the, those group, uh, like very specific city, um, citizens of Ukraine who entered Polish, only Polish border after the 24th um, of March. It does uh, give them also access to uh, social sec uh, services. But then the question is, what about the rest? And what about the system that we already have, which is kind of forgotten uh, forgotten at, uh, at this point? Um, so, um, uh, yes, so, uh, so what we, what we definitely, um, what we definitely need, um, and it's not uh, necessarily happening, is coordinating all of these efforts. Like as of now, the central government is nearly missing from the, from the response and all the response is taken over by non-governmental organization and civil society, just have ordinary people, like uh, many of the 1.3 million um, uh, people crossing the border are housed within ordinary people houses, uh, which is not organized by any means uh, by the central government. Um, so then the question is, where is the system that we have? And, uh, and I suggest the system that we already have uh, should be used to, to a broader extent, especially the, assuming it will be uh, um, supported by a lot of additional, additional funding that is needed. Um, yes, so um, the, the current proposal of the government was simply increasing or offering for one very specific group of people crossing the Ukrainian border access to Polish healthcare or education system uh, or employment market on the same condition as Polish citizens is nearly not, uh, not enough because refugees crossing the border are not in the same position as native Polish speakers uh, who are not traumatized by the war and understand uh, very well the local reality. Uh, so we need more. We need, uh, we need educational programs being adjusted to, um, uh, to on the one hand having more Ukrainian students in the classroom that are non-Polish speakers, but on the other hand, uh, school curriculums uh, being modified to be more inclusive towards, uh, towards the changing demography of our society. We need housing systems that will go way beyond just, uh, you know, the uh, um, ho hosting uh, Ukrainians uh, in, in private apartments. Uh, given the high inflation in Poland, this is not a sustainable solution. I'm not sure many people will be able to offer their couches for more than, I don't know, a month or a couple of months. And that, uh, that's still missing in Poland. The same with an access to the healthcare system, providing access, and again, for just a, a one specific um, group of refugees crossing the Ukrainian border, it's not enough. We need trainings for medical staff uh, to, um, uh, to address the needs of uh, often traumatized non-Polish speakers. 
Uh, and most of all, we need uh, a system of crisis management that is still not existing. And it's something which is, uh, I mean, it's wonderful how civil society and some local governments are, are responding, but this system is um, increasingly inefficient, not coordinated. Um, and th that coordination is critical and is critically missing right now. And then, um, um, and then moving uh, moving forward, um, of course, it's it's also great that international actors are stepping in, such as UNHCR, with the plans that uh, that develop that, that they develop for uh, for Poland. But then that um, that raises some concerns regarding what will be the implication of that for the whole refugee reception system um, in Poland uh, in future. And uh, since we are still missing like a real government led plan. So the question is, do we want, uh, do we want nearly entirely pri privatized system, meaning provided by nonprofit organizations and civil society and not by the government. And I, I have a lot of concerns about building such a system. And this is something that perhaps not entirely intentionally, uh, international actors are supporting at this, po at this point um, uh, in Poland. Why that raises the concerns? Well, it raises concerns about sustainability of providing um, uh, such a subcontracted services to private actors, how sustainable that is, how much can we control the quality of, of such services being provided uh, uh, to refugees, um, how well can we coordinate uh, such efforts? And here again, like, uh, critical role of the central government there, there should be a critical role in coordinating those efforts by the central government which is um which is still um which is still missing um and then well uh, not to be uh not to be too pessimistic um uh there, there are some good um, possible good predictors for future so and and that can be also true for the for the whole uh, eu actually given the given the massive demographic crisis that we have in poland poland has one of the lowest birth rate in europe and then in other european countries perhaps bringing in more people who will perhaps want to actually stay here is not such a uh, is not such a bad idea uh, and then looking specifically at Poland, although in Poland um, attitudes towards refugees became very negative, specifically following the 2015 um, parliamentary campaign, and then the current government has been using a lot of anti-migrant and anti-refugee rhetoric, which was even strengthened with the recent crisis at the Belarusian border. Uh, but at the same time, the attitudes toward Ukrainians are very positive in Poland. So, uh, so that's, uh, that's kind of... Um, uh, th that's kind of like a more uh, silver lining uh, uh, in this situation. Um, and then again, this, this, uh, and also this, this crisis um, have shown like incredible self-organizing and, and grassroots support that uh, in some ways actually started during the Belarusian crisis. So a lot of like, grassroots grassroot movement people who were entirely not interested and knew nothing about migration started being interested and self-organizing. And now those networks, those no local networks has been uh, massively developed and used also to, um, uh, to support uh, uh, refugees coming from, from Ukraine. But of course, uh, such efforts cannot be sustained uh, in a very long run, specifically with the uh, housing being provided mostly by regular citizens um, or res residents of Poland and not coordinated and not supported by the central government. Um, so, um, yes, yeah, so I'm, um, I'm a bit uh, worried about, uh, about 
what uh, I'm specifically worried from the from the perspective of of the refugee reception system and then the situation um, and then the situation of refugees in Poland. But I think a lot of those uh, issues and risks that we see in Poland can be translated in, into issues and risks on, on the whole uh, EU level. Um, because those uh, those ad hoc mechanisms that are currently created uh, in Poland, but also at the EU level uh, in terms of refugees, um, on the one hand, it's it's good because we need some quick response, like the traditional asylum procedure cannot be really implemented for a couple million peoples in a uh, in a short term. But perhaps by providing some temp by offering some kind of a temporary status, we should still be offering and and funding at least for people who need that uh, access to integration programs and and specific policies that exist all around the Europe in terms of uh, um, supporting the integration people of people of people who are traumatized and coming uh, from war zones, which is the case of of many um, uh, refugees uh, from Ukraine right now. Uh, so I, I, I am concerned about creating like a new uh, reality of the uh, of the refugee asylum or of the refugee protection system. Um, but at, on the other hand, if we offer um, path to uh, citizenship as it is for um, for refugees, and if we offer or keep on offering the existing or using the existing refugee integration programs that exist, also, of course, with a massive financial support that is needed, because at this point, it's it, at least in Poland, it could absolutely not serve such a such a large number of people. So that that's that's something which can produce um, in the long run um, uh, better better results. Um, and uh, yeah, I th I think I will um, I think I will f finish with uh, with such a reflection that relates to the um, situation in Poland, but I think can also translate or have implication or or be relevant for um, for the broader EU. So um, so what what is currently happening in Poland is is like focusing on or what what the government is focusing on right now is uh is is providing some some kind of temporary legal status from you refugees um uh, from ukraine and providing some kind of access to social services without um without first of all utilizing the existing tools such as integration programs uh, that we have and without a long-term plan of how do we see the future of uh, of refugees in Poland. There is no uh, long-term strategy that would have some kind of ideal outcome in in which we want to end up. So without um, um, so not having such a plan does not mean that things will just go the way we want. Um, actually um, doing little in terms of long-term plan planning or not recognizing the fact that our societies and both Polish society is probably um, uh, within a broader European community will change irreversibly with these high numbers of people coming here. Without recognizing those, those changes, it doesn't mean that they, they don't happen. Um, they will happen, we will just have less impact on, on the direction of those changes. So, um, so I hope, um, I hope there will be more planning and strategizing on the side of um, Polish government and maybe with the support or pressure from the EU to develop, uh, to define such a direction of what, what do we want uh, to happen with our society in future. Um, well, this, th this is just critically 
uh, critically important that such a discussion or such a reflection and then strategy and long term plan plan happens because without it the, the outcomes for the society and also for the refugees might not be what we would uh, actually want. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Carolina. We, we do have some questions that have come in. So what I was going to do is move immediately to the uh, questions about suggest who they might be directed towards. First of all, we've got some que a question from Alexia Tizzano, who, and I think this is maybe for Marty Arashevich, because what Alexia is asking about is the situation of stateless and undocumented people fleeing Ukraine for Poland and the requirements to enter Poland, in particular in terms of documents. So that's a question from Alexia. I'll, I'll, put up, there's two, I'll ask two or three more so we get a, a range of questions. Then maybe the next one I think could go more to Marta Pashoka, which is again from Alexia, but connects with a question raised by Joanne Van Selm, which is about the temporary protection directive. So Alexia is asking for, to hear a bit more on what Joanne asks about is specifically is registration within the provisions of the directive. Uh, how are people being registered? Is it by local or national authorities? Or, or, or so it's really a general question about registration. Uh, then perhaps this might be for Carolina, or, uh, uh, but it's a question from Federica Infantino here at the MPC, who asks about the role of a European asylum agency. Is it involved in supporting Poland? And if so, how? And are there also private companies offering service provisions for reception and integration? Uh, and we have another question, which I think would go to Carolina from Joanne Van Selm, uh, although other people, please feel free if other people want to intervene as well on these. But Joanne is asking about uh, whether there's thinking about establishing temporary Ukrainian schools. Uh, and Joanne Van Selm suggests maybe using buildings vacant due to pandemic work from home. So questionnaire about education. We're getting other questions as well, but I think we'll start with those. Maybe go begin with uh, Marty Arasevic and uh, uh, go in the order that we did the presentations, if that's okay. Over to you, Marta. Thank you very much. Um, as mentioned already, there is, uh, according to our law on foreigners, there is a, there is an institution, legal institution, so-called uh, extraordinary entry right based on the decision of the head of border guards and those people because stateless stateless people they it doesn't mean that they're undocumented right on the on the it's it's on the contrary they're documented but the undocumented people uh, they they may enter poland based on this uh, uh, extraordinary entry uh, basis and they are given 15 days to regularize their stay which generally means usually because this is what I can see like in Warsaw in the field, meaning going also to embassy, right? Because sometimes these are uh, what we can see now. Uh, the students, the main countries that students are coming, these are for instance Nigeria or India, and they need just to go to their embassies and uh, and decide what to do and. Uh, and also maybe uh, one more thing on these Ukrainian schools, because I'm involved a little bit, so I will answer. Uh, yes, uh, with pandemic, it's a little bit different because we have, I'm also a mother, right? So I know quite well educational system. So generally, uh, we don't have any empty schools uh, because, you know, pandemic has finished officially in Poland, at least all the regulations of so children regularly go to school. Uh, but um, we have uh, quite a big, a Ukrainian minority, ethnic minority, meaning that they, they've been living here forever, right? This is their country. And of course, they are Ukrainian schools and they are already starting operating. So at least in Warsaw, I know there are two schools and since, since Monday, children may go there. Thank you. Okay, so now going, uh, in fact, I tried to address most of your questions or at least provide you with good uh, uh, sources uh, in the chat, so I hope that you received uh, all of it. Uh, but just to be very brief in terms of two points, so I would like to, to refer uh, firstly to this registration issue. As far as I know, if uh, if there is something that should be added, I, I would like to kindly ask my colleague Marta 
uh, to maybe add something or correct me. So uh, once again, referring to our CMR spotlight, where we also raised the issue of, the, of the so-called reception and information points. So uh, there are two different types of registration, let's say registration points or the points where the, 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 the refugees can learn about what to do, how to do and where. So uh, reception points are uh, element of the management of the war related migration. These are created by the voivod. So the voivods, let's say that they, they are the governance at the level of 16 voivod ships, so regions that we have in Poland. Uh, and they are supposed to cooperate, so the heads, the governors of their 16 regions, with local authorities. So, for example, the authorities of cities. Uh, during the first two days, these points uh, functioned only in the border voivod ships. So, uh, the voivod, so these eight, uh, eight border crossing points uh, uh, between Poland uh, and Ukraine. Now they are everywhere in the country and a full list can be found on the website of the Office for Foreigners. So Office for Foreigners, this is the government body responsible for, let's say, uh, any uh, foreigners related issues. Uh, so they, they are responsible for immigration policy and asylum issues. Uh, so as of March 6, there were 28 uh, reception points where the people uh, could register themselves. The point, what is important, this registration was not, and still I think is not compulsory. It is, uh, it is the people can register. So let me give you an example. Uh, we have the migrants uh, just crossing the, the border uh, between Ukraine and Poland. And next to the uh, border crossing point, the, the, there is, or there are, uh, there are desks that are considered this uh, reception registration points and the people uh, can provide the, the uh, personal details. Then they are also provided with like the basic package of materials of uh, how to get to a given city where the transport can be found uh, uh, to, be, uh, to be careful also in terms of human trafficking um, uh, cases and so on and so on. Uh, these uh, reception points are also um, uh, located in, uh, in the cities. Uh, in Warsaw now, if I'm correct, there are two of them. One is, uh, both of them are in the railway stations. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm correct, Marta, but uh, I think that they are there. Why? Because many people are coming simply, most of the people are coming by, uh, by, uh, by train. We know that people cannot take uh, any, cannot simply go by plane. So trains are now this, I would say, most common way of uh, getting to, 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 to big cities. Uh, and then we have another type of uh, points. These are information points. And um, as of uh, 6th of March, there were 17 uh, information points. So this is in terms of registration. Uh, we still have this draft law uh, in progress. So uh, it's not uh, in force. So maybe according, and I don't, uh, I, I don't know the very details of this 70 page document. So I cannot tell you more how precisely this registration process will be, uh, will be uh, managed later. In terms of temporary protection. So as, as I've just said um, uh, during my contribution. So, so it, it was up to the national authorities how to transpose the specific legal instrument into the uh, national legal uh, regime. So in case of Poland, as far as I understand, it will be explained and transposed properly by this new uh, law or draft law on assistance to Ukrainian citizens in connection to very recent armed conflict. Uh, but what we can tell you, it has changed. So the way how the government and the Council of Ministers wanted to treat this issue. So the version of the draft law from uh, two days ago did not include specifically and did not mention the term of temporary protection. Now, as we've learned this morning with Marta from one of our colleagues, the newest, uh, the most recent version of this draft law indicates precisely and uh, mentions per, per se this temporary protection, 
but it refers to, uh, to this temporary protection solution that is already explained in another law that we have. So the law on, uh, on providing protection to foreigners uh, on the territory of Poland. So it makes some links to other law we have uh, in the country. And uh, maybe I will briefly also comment in the context of this temporary protection issues, one of the questions, there was the question about uh, the, 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 the asylum, uh, the international, the forms of international mm -hmm. protection, so refugee status and subsidiary protection. From the point of view of many of our colleagues that are, for example, social workers working with the beneficiaries of international protection, these forms of protection are not the best solution for these people uh, because uh, as, as we know, this is the mass influx, so it will take it, 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 it may take much more time to process case by case each application. And here we have this mass legal tool, let's say. Yeah, so this is it, I think. Thank you. Before, before Carolina starts, can I just an additional question, for Carolina, as well, which I think is maybe something you could just uh, be very great to get your thoughts on. And it comes from uh, Peter, uh, Peter Acri, if I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, who, uh, oh, sorry, it's, I'm getting my questions mixed up. It's a, well, it's a question for Carolina, but it's about your take on the difference in attitudes towards Ukrainian refugees compared to those from the, from the past in, in all uh, Central European countries. Uh, so it's not from Pete, so I'm getting a bit confused, but anyway, that hopefully the question is clear. So over to you, Carolina. Uh, yes, thank you. So uh, uh, maybe maybe I'll start with just quickly following up on uh, what my uh, uh, colleagues were saying. So uh, I, I, um, I just want to add, um, um, I think a lot of it's critical to see how things operate on the ground, and that also highlights some broader systemic issues uh, that we have. So, for example, uh, Marta mentioned the information points, and you know the way it's arranged is often that um, uh, that uh, the representatives of the central government are um, um, are using or cooperation cooperating with. Uh, non-profit organizations, which are th then co in the current situation, they are completely overwhelmed and uh, using often uh, volunteers. Uh, it's an, all, um, in many cases on volunteer basis. Um, and then the, the overworked and overwhelmed volunteers in the end provide the, uh, the information support for um, uh, for refugees, which is still in, in much insufficient um, given the needs. So like this pu pushing responsibility towards the lower, lower, lower level up to up to up to the volunteers is is very, very problematic and in the in the current system. And I was asked about also private the role of private companies. So these are all like new actors that also uh, Polish non governmental organization and some local governments are, are discovering that those kind of actors were um, not that present and interested in uh, in issues related to migration until now, but now they are actually getting interested and and sponsoring different support programs. Um, just yesterday during another seminar, we heard how um, how even um, some uh, local companies or um, or employer association from from rural areas who has been working historically with um, with seasonal Ukrainian workers are now inviting uh, well mostly um, women with children because their their workers usually cannot leave Ukraine um, and offering them support so. So there are new actors uh, that are uh, that are that are helping. Um, I was also asked about the the the, uh, the schooling. So to what Marta said, I can just add that um, um, we we have some again prior to the current crisis. There has been established some mechanism with using cultural assistance and like different kind of forms to support um, to support refugees in Polish schools, but it was uh, largely inefficient already prior to the current crisis. So we definitely mo need more more of that, which 
is based on more funding basically as a, as a first uh, first premise it the system cannot be run as it is right now mostly on 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 volunteers or um um or under underpaid uh, staff uh and uh yeah also just a, a quick comment about the integration programs so that's true that this kind of programs cannot be multiplied to 1.3 million, um, but also not necessarily all of the 1.3 million would need such a such an in depth uh, in depth support. Not everybody is deeply traumatized by the war and will require a lot of time for recovery, but some will, and that, that's why I think it should be more um, more available. Um, Yes, and uh, what is there anything else? Uh, temporary school, temporary protection. Um, yes, uh, is there anything else I should? I think that was. I think that was. Uh, there's some more questions, so we can come back to you in a few minutes. We've got. We have uh, some more questions. So if I pose those, we can come back to you shortly, Carolina. So thank, thanks for that response. Uh, oh, so just yeah. some of the issues that we have, which I'll share with you. I, I think this one, uh, it may it may be for Caroline, it may be for Marta, but about the role of the ION. Is the ION playing any role in refugee reception? That's a question from Laser Bruma. And the Polish security forces, for example, the military, are they playing any logistical role? Those questions from Laser Bruma. Uh, uh, then... Uh, so again, uh, apologies, I miss out some questions. We've got quite a lot of questions, so I'll do my best just to put some of them. Uh, a question from Conal Yafarova, who, uh, which I think is maybe towards Marta Yaroslavich, which is asking about information on age, gender dimensions of refugees from Ukraine, given mostly women and children are crossing the borders. Do we have information on the, also on the proportion of citizens and non-citizens? So that's a kind of factual question from from uh, Conor Yafarova. Uh, Ray Kozlowski asks about long-term planning uh, and whether arrangements are being made for resettlement of Ukrainian refugees from Poland to Canada, the United States and Australia. Uh, uh, and also Conor asks another question which is about discrimination. Uh, and ask about what kind of discrimination are observed towards citizens and non-citizens of refugees from Ukraine. Uh, but I ask, and Conal Lafarova asks if these are institutional. Uh, Peter Acre, this is, I think this is the final question that can squeeze into this without overloading our speakers. Peter asks whether citizens other than those of Ukraine are obliged to leave their home country after the 15 day uh, time limit if they don't apply for international protection or can they move within the Schengen area. Uh, so maybe if we go back in the order in which, again, the order in which you spoke. So over to you, Marta. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not sure. If, I will try to, to to kind of address all the questions, but maybe I won't be. It, it, there are many of them. Don't, right? don't, so don't worry about it. I will start, the I will start from the end. There is a visa-free regime between uh, Ukraine and European Union, meaning between Schengen zone, right? So it means that Ukrainian citizens can like live for any EU country for up to three months when they have biometric passport. And around 40%, maybe more now, but I'm sorry, I don't have the recent data. Maybe, no, I think much more. Yeah, it, it was like, um, I, I think the majority of Ukrainian uh, of Ukrainians have biometric passports. So generally they are allowed to stay in the EU and move freely. So they can move to Germany, Italy, whatever, like when, whenever they want, right? So this is up to three months. And this temporary protection directives give them right for, for, for legal stay. Uh, for a, for a year, right? In Polish case, it's like it's uh, the Polish case is more kind of f favorable, so it gives them a right to legally stay and work for eighteen months. So when it comes to Ukrainian citizens, everything is clear. But also, uh, it, it's quite clear when it comes to the residents uh, to the uh, foreign third country nationals who are residents in Ukraine because this temporary protection directives also gives them the right 
to stay for up to one year, right? Uh, but of course, it depends on the transposition. I was not looking at the particular national laws. I guess uh, some because in Poland it's only happening. It will like the, this is what we are discussing now that uh, we are like the, since till now. So uh, we are in the 14th day of the conflict, right? And till now, no law was changed, kind of. We are working on the old legislation system, right? I mean, there were some, uh, there were some uh, temporary crisis management schemes uh, introduced, but they were basing, uh, basis, uh, basing on the existing law, mainly on this disaster regime, right? So, so the prim, uh, so the, the like the ambition was to the decision of the government was to let everybody in, and like as much as as many as possible to save as many as possible lives, and then we will see. And so this is, and only now. Maybe this week, I hope the parliament will adopt the law and then we'll see what are the details, right? So we can, of course, explain the existing law, but maybe it doesn't really uh, make sense because in a week we may have totally different situation. But generally, I believe that the, the conditions will be favorable, right, in terms of legal stay. But of course, the other the other issue is what was mentioned in my, by my colleagues, uh, the social benefits. Uh, how big will be the social benefits, right? Uh, whether, uh, how, uh, how in, of course, all the children, according to the Polish law, it doesn't matter whether they are legal or illegal or whatever. I mean, with a regular status or legal status, they have right to go to school. So they, uh, so it's obvious, uh, for instance, in school of my children, like in the class of my child, or already nine Ukrainian children came. So this is really happening very quickly, right? The other thing is whether the schools are prepared. Of course, they are not prepared. That uh, uh, What Karolina mentioned, we, we don't have so many cultural assistants and so on, right, to help those children to prepare. Uh, so uh, when it comes to resettlement, uh, I, I, I'm not sure. I think we didn't hear that our government was uh, conducting any discussions either with the European Commission or with uh, other governments, right? I think it's not a topic yet. And I think it shouldn't be a topic yet also because this is really just like two weeks. And what is very important also, I guess, is that like um, majority of those people, they really, and I am talking to those people, would like to come back home, right? Of course, long-term solutions are needed, but maybe not for everybody. Uh, we should remember that because of the Ukrainian uh, regulations uh, and the, the mass mobilization, men were not allowed to leave the country. Men, men are not allowed the, the leave, to leave the country because they need to serve in the army, meaning uh, that's only like half of the family is coming, right? So, of course, this is temporary solutions. They, the, those women, they want to join back with their husbands, which is normal, right? So, um, that's why refugee status, they are not interested in the refugee status because uh, they are afraid that, you know, they will, they will passport will be taken back for a while, whatever, and they want to, to, to be offered such a solution that in every moment, if, you know, if something happens, they can come back if there is a peace, yeah? So a temporary solution is needed. Of course, long-term planning is needed, but more, I would say more in the plans, what we need for now. This is really like temporary protection scheme for up to year, I would say, school for children and social benefits. And of course, jobs, but jobs only for those who, who can work. Because, you know, also, as I said, half million of children came, right? And uh, often it's really small children. And this is only half of the family that is coming. So this is very particular influx, right? I'm not sure whether it's, there is a one, I was thinking of Syria, I was, I, I'm, I'm trying to kind of compare, right? But I still don't see, uh, I mean, this is really, this is really atypical, yeah? And we need to think what are the solutions and maybe the final question about the proportion of the people who are living, of course, like we should start researching migrants now. Because like we, what we know is only like, you know, some 
I mean, like we talk with them, of course, but these are more like we talk because we also like we are volunteers, we try to help and so on. So, uh, but we didn't start any like systemic research yet. So uh, all we can do is to compare a number of people who were coming to uh, like in the train to Poland and then who were leaving to Germany, for instance. But so far, it seems that, um, but this is really like, not systemic and it's not scientific, certainly, right? So uh, what we can see, I would say that a, a, a lot of people were living in the first wave because the first wave, the first three days, these were people who were, had networks in the EU. These people were coming mainly, originating from either Western Ukraine or Kiev. And the majority of them really knew where to go, Denmark, Germany, I don't know, other countries, and they didn't even stay in Poland, right? For now, a lot of trains, so they, the, the evacuation trains started coming for Mariupol, not Mariupol, not, uh, sorry, Kharkiv, uh, Zaporizhia, and other cities. And those people, these regions, they don't have a tradition of labor migration to the EU. So the, those people, they rather stay in Poland because they have no capacities. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Marta. So over, over to Marta Bachoker, if there's uh, yeah, so what you'd like to add. So I would like to add, to refer to two points. So uh, let's start with the different stakeholders. So this is, I hope that you can see or not. Do you see it? Yes, we yeah, see okay. it. Yeah, okay. So this is just... Uh, uh, this is just um, one of the uh, one of the materials that were shared by you and HCR office uh, in recent days after the meetings that we had uh, explaining to Polish and international stakeholders what um, refugee response plan for Poland is and how it will work in terms of financial, support for different projects and initiatives to be uh, implemented on the ground. So uh, there was the question about the involvement of IOM. Honestly, uh, uh, I very briefly checked if uh, IOM is included uh, by name among the main stakeholders of this response plan and I, I, I cannot find it, but I, I think that the answer is very simple. So. There are 12 partners to be officially included in this uh, plan, including, as we can, uh, as we can um, see on the UNHCR website, UN agencies. So if we look at the scheme, uh, we see, and then at the, this division of the Refugee Coordination Forum, uh, among this uh, lead or leading agency on, on behalf of uh, UN, we have UNICEF, so Children Education, we have UNHCR, so Forced Migrants, and we have World Health Organization. So there is no uh, uh, IOM, and as we know since 2016, if I'm correct, uh, IOM has become an, uh, another UN agency, UN Migration Agency, and IOM mandate has nothing to do or not much to do with the, uh, the governance of forced migration and the reception and asylum policies. So I'm not uh, surprised that it's not among the key stakeholders. Maybe it will be included later. But what I would like to uh, stress here in terms of this um, uh, uh, scheme, uh, so the government is uh, on the top. So UNHCR can only be involved in this crisis management uh, according to the mandate it has in Poland. So it, it is its task, I mean, its main responsibility is just to put all these different stakeholders together and then um, co-coordinate it with the government. Uh, there were also today the question about the children and uh, female migrants. So we can see here about this division of key sectors that are under the discussion and work uh, uh, within this body that we have education, basic needs sector, but also we have GB Fout, so, so uh, gender-based violence subsector, protection sector, and child protection subsector. So children really matter uh, children related issues and their safety really matter during this crisis. Then there was also the question about the role of uh, European agencies. So uh, in terms of, so there are two main migration related agencies, as we know. What we can see on the website of Frontex, this is only this declaration that it can provide any support uh, to member states that might be re requested. 
So this is the announcement from 25th. There is nothing more up to date. So uh, we've seen the same on, during the crisis on the Polish Belarusian border. Uh, European Border and Coast Guard Agency can only uh, support the EU member state when the government on the government uh, request. So simply, it cannot just spread or deploy its uh, border guards, uh, European border guards, for example, on the border. So Frontex, as far as I as I know, and I think, is not present now uh, uh, in Poland to support uh, our um, our stakeholders. And then e, uh, the EU agency for asylum, the former EASO. So uh, the the most recent update is from uh, from two days ago, from seven of March. So there is a kind of joint statement. Uh, regarding providing support uh, of the EU, uh, to the EU institutions and EU member states. So this is very general message as far as I know, and as I've seen during different uh, stakeholders meetings that we have almost every day, uh, yeah, uh, e e e EU AA is not there so far. So maybe it will be, uh, it will be requested uh, to provide uh, support by our office for foreigners as it, it was in the past or to exchange some uh, some details but when we know how our reception um, system for this uh, temporary uh, protection uh, instrument uh, is uh, implemented because european asylum support office usually supported the member states with for example relocation scheme collecting the data and so on now we are somewhere in the middle so we are still in progress uh, and the second point was about uh, uh, non-Ukrainians. I can give you an example from another university I'm working for, so uh, Warsaw School of Economics. We we've receiving since almost one week many emails at our uh, help uh, for Ukraine mailbox requests from students of different nationalities, not only Ukrainians, also from African countries, how they can transfer to Warsaw School of Economics, how they can apply for this uh, for our university, why they want to do this very quickly, as it was mentioned by Marta, because if they are uh, students from African countries, they they are supposed to stay only 15 days uh, from the day they, ent they enter to Poland. Uh, but what we did, for example, uh, during the very first days of uh, receiving these students, for example, at our dormitories for one, two day nights to stay, we uh, contacted the embassies if the countries have their representation offices in Poland or in Berlin. So, for example, N Nigeria is based in Warsaw, but Mozambique is not. So there is another group online working on to provide support to, for example, uh, students from African countries. Uh, uh, to transfer them from EU member states to, uh, to, to countries of origin. So, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I, I can just quickly add actually to the slides that Mar Marta was just so showing with the UNHCR plan. So just to clarify, because there is like government on the top, uh, but uh, many of these services across different areas from education, healthcare, and so on, uh, are planned to be provided on the ground by um, non-governmental organization, meaning the whole system is built on like a very like a privatized values that, that this is uh, uh, this is how it's going to work. So I think it uh, requires some um, reflection. Is this the kind of system kind of alternative to the state? Is this, is this the kind of system that we want to build um, and support? Um, and just very quickly to one of the uh, the question about uh, uh, also the um, deserving and undeserving refugees. So I just want to stress that I mean the the current po Polish legislation is is definitely uh, even in the most even in the most kind of generous. Uh, assumption for the people who uh, crossed Polish Ukrainian borders, hold Ukrainian um, uh, uh, citizenship, uh, and have Ukrainian families and cross the border after the 24th, still is going to. It's going to create like a two, um, like a very different group of refugees than those who have been processed through the um, through the asylum procedure with access to integration program and with clear path to citizenship. So this is, I think, very problematic, and th this can be problematic as well for the whole um, uh, EU asylum scheme. Like, do we want to have this more and less deserving, and given the 
proposed protection the Ukraine people coming from Ukraine would be those less deserving. Thank you. Thanks, Carolina. I think we're going to have to uh, conclude now. We've had I mean, really fantastic and informative presentations from Marta, Marta and Carolina. It's been, and I've, we've had a lot of engagement also from our audience, which, and what we've also done in the YouTube chat is added some links because uh some of the questions can't be addressed some are going to be really the focus not one well, not just for research but on just practical interventions because of the scale the human scale of what is happening at the moment i think we've got fantastic insight into that and also what we can or should be doing as citizens in the in the face of this large-scale displacement which affects us all uh so really grateful for the contributions today and hopefully this this is something that's going to be so important in the, in well, unfortunately for I, I suspect for quite a long time. We're gonna and we're gonna rely on the expertise of people like Marta, Marta and Carolina to really help us understand some of the dynamics as they emerge and uh, how we can how we can respond. So hopefully this is part of an ongoing conversation uh, and with which many of the people watching can engage as well. So uh, yeah, so just to conclude by thanking the speakers for their excellent and insightful presentations and the audience for their fantastic questions. So uh, yeah, good day to everybody. Thanks very much.